Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to view this video. This is a longer version of the talk that I'm presenting during the proceedings of TCC 2021. This is about my work on updatable public key encryption in the standard model and this joint work with Evgeny Dodis and Daniel Wicks. Um, without much ado, let's just quickly jump into it. Let's begin with a quick refresh on public key encryption and motivate forward secure public key encryption using it. And then we will tie it up with our primitive of updatable public key encryption. Uh, the, let us recall the setting of updatable pub, uh, public key encryption. You have Alice and you have Bob. Bob wishes to communicate with Alice. In order to facilitate that, Alice generates a public key secret key pair, keeps the secret key for herself and communicates the public key to Bob. Bob, with knowledge of the public key, can choose to encrypt a message M, not, uh, with the public key to get ciphertext C0 and communicates that ciphertext to Alice. Alice, with knowledge of the secret key, is in a position to decrypt C0 and recover the underlying message M0. And Bob can do it repeatedly. And at some point of time, we assume that there is an attack. And there is an adversary who is capable of corrupting the user. And your uh, Eve chooses to corrupt Alice and recover the secret key info. Now, it is obvious that if Eve has kept track of messages C0 through C4, can use a secret key to de decrypt the ciphertext to recover the underlying message M0 through M4, making all of them insecure. Now, the question we ask ourselves is can we protect the messages? Let's take a more granular look at when the compromise happens. And let us assume that the compromise has happened sometime between Alice decrypting C1 and Alice decrypting C2. Now, the problem is that the messages from M2, M, uh, M3, and M4 are impossible to protect. Whereas the goal of forward secure encryption is to protect M0 and M1 because those messages were received before the corruption happened. And this is the forward secure public key encryption. Uh, Alice generates a public key secret key pair for a particular time period, say time period zero, keeps secret key SK0 for herself and communicates PK0 to Bob. Bob, with knowledge of PK0, can encrypt a message M0 of its choice to communicate the ciphertext C0 to Alice. In addition, Bob also moves the public key from PK0 to a new time period, PK1. Now, Alice, with knowledge of the uh, secret key SK0 and having received the ciphertext C0, can decrypt the message uh, to get M0 and also moves the public as yes, a secret key that she has from SK0 to SK1. And Bob does this repeatedly. Now, if SK2 is corrupted, the goal of M uh, forward secure encryption or forward secure public key encryption to be precise is that M0 and M1 remain secure and M2, M3 and M4 are basically impossible to protect because those ciphertexts were, re uh, were received after, um, after uh, the compromise has happened. Now let us quickly take a look at related work in FS literature. Pretty much the state of the art is the work by Kennedy et al. Uh, where they propose constructions of forward secure public key encryption from hierarchical identity based encryption. Now, most recently in crypto 2018, you had work, uh, your two works that uh, propose a notion of key updatable public key encryption schemes, where now the key updates can be labeled by arbitrary strings, but once again, the constructions work from HYBE. Now, HYBE schemes are often more complicated and inefficient when compared to their public key encryption counterparts. So, the question we confront in this paper, in this research, uh, is can we close the efficiency gap by suitably weakening the security note definition? And specifically, what we want is to use the ciphertext that the sender is communicating with the receiver to help achieve maybe a weaker notion of forward secrecy. Now, let us take a look at how this would look. Uh, and the most simplest setting to visualize would be the symmetric key setting. So Alice has a key K0, and Bob also has a key K0. Now, one simple thing that uh, Bob can do is when Bob is encrypting a message and not of its choice, will also encrypt the new key K1. So Alice with knowledge of K0 will be in a position to decrypt 
and recover both M0 and K1. And this can happen repeatedly. This is a very simple setting uh, and very simple scheme indeed. However, the symmetric scheme is inherently uh, one sender, one receiver. And if we need for if we needed to support uh, multiple senders, uh, um, we would have to rely on some kind of a um, public key primitive. So let us take a look at a direct counterpart of symmetric key encryption, where I'm just replacing all of the keys uh, with public key secret key pair. So this is how it would look, where I'm replacing in this manner. So what has happened is that Bob chooses a PK1, SK1 pair, and then sends SK1 along with PK1 to uh, Alice. Now Alice can decrypt the message to recover M0 and SK1, and can simply uh, make sure that SK1 and PK1 are consistent, and so on and so forth. However, we recall that the issue that we had was that we wanted to support multiple senders. So what if we have some kind of a, uh, another user, Charlie, who wants to also participate in sending messages to uh, Alice? One issue that, that is immediate is that Charlie needs to keep track of the most recent message so that Charlie knows the public key that is most current and can use that public key to encrypt messages. So specifically, uh, uh, Charlie needs to keep track and make sure that uh, Charlie knows PK2 to intervene at this point to encrypt with a message uh, using PK2. So in essence, this requires strong synchronization. However, all is not lost because for some applications such as secure messaging, this is not a huge problem. We can assume some kind of serialization. So are we done with the setting? Is it a case of, is it the case of and they spoke securely after? Unfortunately, not. As with any message, uh, as with any scheme, uh, there are lurking trust issues here. And what is the trust issue here? Let us now look at a multiple sender where both uh, Bob and Charlie wish to communicate with Alice. So this is how the scheme would look. And we have Alice, we have Bob, and we have Charlie. Now Bob begins the first message sending by first moving PK0 to PK1 and encrypting the new secret key SK1 that is consistent with PK1 along with the message I'm not of its choice. Now we are assuming that these public keys are written in a public manner so that Charlie can quickly recover the most recent public key. Now Alice with knowledge of SK0 as before can decrypt to get M0 and SK1. Now Charlie will retrieve PK1, generate a new SK2 PK2 pair and send a message of his choice, which is M1, and also move the public record to PK2. And now Alice is in a position to decrypt the message. Now we spoke about trust. So let's look at whom can Charlie trust in the setting. Charlie can trust himself and Charlie can trust the receiver because Alice is the one he's communicating with. And if Alice is a corrupt entity, anyway, the messages are uh, insecure at that point. However, whom does Charlie need to trust actually? It is quite obvious to see that Charlie also needs to trust Bob in the setting. And which might be fine, unless Bob is a male uh, malevolent entity, in which case we clearly have a problem. And this is a big problem, even if you assume an honest but curious model, because either Bob can choose randomness, which could be corrupted later, or Bob can choose bad randomness, or simply Bob can choose not to erase SK1, because if Bob still had SK1, Bob can decrypt the message that's being sent by Charlie, recovering the entire message. So this is basically on a, on a protocol where we expect the users to generate the new public key secret key pair and immediately erase secret key uh, that has been generated from his memory, if from his or their memory, okay? Now, the goal that we have to ask is reasonable security even under compromised senders. And the solution is quite simple. The ciphertext will aid in producing the secret keys chain and not contain the secret keys themselves. And this is what we call updatable public key encryption. So let us take a look at the updatable public key encryption, the primitive with its uh, the syntax and security. Um, 
setting an ordered sequence of So let us, the setting here as before, we assume that some kind of a serialization mechanism has happened where every user receives the same ordered sequence of ciphertext, which is to be decrypted by the receiver. We can either assume it's one sender or there's some external mechanism to serialize. Uh, in a nutshell, sender or senders possibly produce a public key chain. The ciphertext will help receive, uh, help the receiver produce a secret key chain and the, both the chains need to be consistent. However, the key point here is that the public key chain is not fixed a priori. So therefore, what we get is a security requirement that any good ciphertext uh, within, uh, within uh, um, quotes restores security irrespective of what happens between them. And we will formalize this intuition uh, with the syntax and security in just a few slides. So let us look a look at, take a look at the syntax of UPKE. Um, UPK, much like any public key encryption, will have the three key algorithms of gen, encryption, and decryption. Uh, and the original updatable public key encryption, which was proposed by Jost and others, uh, used three additional algorithms. One to generate some kind of an update token. One to use the update token to generate uh, the uh, up update the public key. And one which uses the tokens to update the secret key. Uh, the work by Alvin and others simplified it where they just assume that uh, an update happened every after every message. So they combine the update process and the encryption process together, update public key to be precise and the encryption process and update secret key and the decryption process together. However, for clarity, we have tried to take the middle ground where we will assume that there are five algorithms as opposed to six, which is a huge saving. Um, and these are our algorithm. We are, all, as mentioned, we have a general gen algorithm that will generate the public key secret key pair an encryption algorithm that will take a public key and uh, a message him and they use some randomness to generate the ciphertext in the C in the ciphertext space. Um, decryption will have a secret key uh, and will be in a position to decrypt the, uh, secret, uh, the ciphertext C to recover the underlying message M. In addition, we, we have two other algorithms, which is update public key, which is a randomized algorithm that takes public key, the old public key and produces the new public key PK prime and something called, we call as the update ciphertext. Now the update secret key will take the old secret key and the update ciphertext that was produced here to produce a new secret key SK prime that is consistent with PK prime, hence the colors. Um, so what is the correctness requirement? The correctness requirement is that if a message is encrypted with a public key, it is decrypted by the corresponding secret key. A very, uh, a, a very naive uh, extension of a standard PKE correctness. So what is the security? What is our uh, security model? So we are, what we present here is something called as INDCRCPA star. Well, you know what INDCPA might mean. The CR and the star are uh, um, notations that we will explain in the very next slide, but let's take a look at the security definition here. So we have the challenger and we have the adversary. Now the, adver uh, the challenger will generate a public key secret key pair uh, for time period zero, and also chooses the, the random bit for the, uh, the CPA part of the game. It will communicate public, uh, the public key PK not to the adversary. The adversary will provide a sequence of randomness RI, say Q such randomness, along with its challenge messages M0 star and M1 star. Now this is what the challenger does. It will sequentially update the public key for Q times from PK0 to PKQ and similarly update the secret key as well. So as follows, so it will take R1 PK0 to produce a new public key PK1 and the update ciphertext up one. Up one becomes in the, uh, um, becomes an input to the update secret key algorithm along with SK0 to produce SK1. This happens repeatedly. Now, at which point, what the adversary, what the challenger does is that challenger will choose a randomness R star of his choice and produce the corresponding PK star and SK star. In essence, what is happening is that this R star corresponds to a good ciphertext where it's not an adversarially controlled randomness. So as long as this has happened, security is restored. It's what our security cave will capture. So what does um, the adversary receive? The adversary will receive PK star 
and the secret key wherein there is a compromise that has happened, which has made the adversary possible to receive the secret key along with an update ciphertext that was actually used upstart and the challenge ciphertext, which is an encryption of PK key, uh, MB start under PKQ. Okay, so the idea here is that as long as there is one good randomness, even if everything that before was adversarially controlled and possibly zero randomness went into it, there is still security. It's a fundamental goal. Now the adversary will respond with B prime. And the probability that the, uh, the red attacker wins is probably that B is equal to B prime. And this is standard advantage definition. So this is our uh, security definition. But as I said, what does CR mean and why the start? It's something we will look at right now. Um, but before that, we will quickly uh, look at differences, some subtle differences from existing definitions of the security game. To begin with, Joost and others does not provide for malicious randomness. What it allows is for the adversary to expose randomness instead. And the original definition of, uh, uh, the other definition of Alvin and others uh, were included the mass MI because we call that some of the update public key encryption uh, uh, update public key operation and the encryption were combined together, whereas it's quite unnecessary for our model. So let us look at the security model. CR is basically a short for chosen randomness. Basically, the adversary chooses the randomness as indicated by RIC. This is something that's adversarially chosen. IND CR CPA star is a very simplified model presented here. And what is why what is a simplification? We assume that the secret key is revealed right after the challenge message. So basically, uh, PKQ is used to encrypt uh, the challenge message, and immediately there is a good update that happens, which gives you the secret key right here. However, a more generic assumption would let you choose, uh, let the adversary uh, process provide for more randomness between the challenge phase and the exposed phase, or the uh, reveal phase of the operation. Uh, and we present this more generic version in our full version. Additionally, we also look at the CCA extension of this definition, which will allow for decryption queries, um, and which is also available in the full version. And there is a stronger security model where beyond chosen randomness, which we refer to as chosen update, uh, abridged with CU. And here, the adversary provides update. So rather than just providing randomness RI, the adversary provides an update ciphertext and a public key consistent with the update. What do I mean by public, uh, consistent, uh, public key consistent with the update is that the new public key and when the receiver is uh, decrypts the update ciphertext to and then updates its secret key from SK0 to SK1, SK1 and this provided public key PK1 are consistent. And this is a stronger model. And uh, we present constructions and uh, uh, study this thing a little more detail in the full version of the paper, which we call as INDCUCPA and its CCA counterpart, INDCUCCA, okay? Um, so let us look at where UPKE stands uh, between public key and forward secure public key encryption. And just a uh, quick comparison in a very zoomed out manner. Uh, we will compare along three axes, the efficiency, uh, the assumptions, and the forward security. security, security. It's very efficient. You have a whole bunch of assumptions, DDH, CDH, factoring out of DV, and by definition, it's clearly not forward secure. Uh, whereas FSPKE, on the other hand, is inefficient because most construction, all the constructions are from hype. Now, as more and more hype constructions were built, there were consequently more and more FSPKE constructions from a wide swath of assumptions. And by definition, this is forward secure. Um, the UPKE that was proposed by Joost and others is roughly the same. Uh, uh, efficiency uh, um, as a PKE scheme. Uh, we will look at that construction just a few slides, if not the very next slide. And the assumption here is that it requires a little bit of synchronization as we discussed. And the, the final piece of the puzzle is that it is from the CDH assumption um, and it is in the random oracle model. However, this will serve as a very useful launch pad for our uh, construction and where we will eventually get to. So this is their construction. Uh, so they have a gen algorithm that will basically um, uh, public key, uh, secret key S and compute public key as G to the S. Encryption is uh, used as a randomness and then hashes the randomness. 
and decryption is uh, basically uh, um, the entire scheme is similar to the standard hash telecomal encryption. However, the update public key encryption that they have is they use two randomness, uh, one to generate the randomness R1, uh, using randomness R to, to generate actually a ciphertext, and then update the public key H prime corresponding to uh, G to the R1. So in essence, R1 is the offset to, with which you will update the DAR secret key. And the update secret key is basically uh, decrypting and then updating the secret key SSK plus R1. Now, what is the intuition that's happening here? Let's just take a very zoomed out look. Update public key is basically this. Uh, essentially think of it as there is some secret key uh, offset R1, which is also, uh, which you can use it to update SK prime as SK plus R1. That's the key idea here. So now somehow uh, the uh, update PK should communicate R1 so that the adversary or the receiver can decrypt it to recover the uh, offset. So this is what happens. And the key idea here is that it uses this homomorphism property where uh, uh, H, the public key component H is nothing but G to the S, which is a function of F of S. So that F of SK star of F of R1 is basically PK times F of R1. Uh, this, times being the start operation. So there is some kind of homomorphism. And for us, it's very simple as PK times G to the R1. So now why is it secure? Just a very uh, high level intuition uh, is that let's assume Q is equal to zero. What information does the adversary learn? Now the adversary uh, Q is equal to zero recall means that the adversary has not provided any randomness. So uh, just quickly goes into the challenge phase that it has a secret key as, and it receives PK naught as G to the S. It produces um, M naught star and M one star and receives all of these uh, public key, uh, PK star, the SK star, C star, and upstar. And then it responds with B prime. So let us take a look at each of these terms. So what is SK star? SK star is nothing but S plus some delta. In essence, it's a leakage function of SK. Uh, that's what the adversary receives. And what is upstar actually? Upstart is an encryption of delta star. Essentially here, the message is dependent on the secret key S because the message is encrypted by with PK not corresponding with S and the message itself is nothing but SK star minus S star S, okay? So what we have is that delta star is random and fortunately, which means that the leakage is trivial uh, there's no leakage, you can prove it. And the other, on the other hand, the hash function, which is modeled as a random oracle, will ensure KDM security. So this will be the intuition that we will use to launch towards us and standard model constructions. Uh, the KDM security will allow um, adversary to obtain an encryption of a function of G of the secret keys under a, public, uh, under a particular public key. Uh, and fortunately, we only need circular security. That is an encryption of the secret key and use some additional homomorphisms uh, when we go forward towards standard model. So here we have a vector secret key, uh, say N, uh, N uh, uh, components law. And we can use both BHHO crypto system and dual reg crypto system for this purpose. And we will now encrypt delta bit by bit. So delta uh, is, a vector, is an N bit vector, uh, which is either zero or one. And this seems to be very inherent and we will see why when we get to the constructions. And the problem now is that the leakage SK I star is no longer trivial because I'm taking a component, even if SK1, uh, SK2, SK3 might be an element in ZP, the delta itself is either zero or one. So if you, are, if you get the output, you can easily recover the input. And uh, so what we need is some kind of a simultaneous circular security and leakage resilience. What is circular security and leakage resilience security uh, is that given an encryption of the secret key S and any bounded entropy leakage on S, the scheme is still semantically secure, okay? So let us now, with that, let us now look at our contributions and we will look at the DDH construction. Uh, we will uh, refer you to the full version of the paper for a more robust security uh, uh, proof. We uh, will only present a very high level intuition on what is happening. Okay, so this is our contributions. We built two efficient UPKE schemes in the standard model. 
the constructions in uh, the other two papers, but in the random oracle model, we have one construction from the DDH assumption, which is based on the BHHO construction. Construction two is from the LWE uh, assumption, which is based on the dual regev uh, crypto system. And uh, uh, this is where our uh, um, efficiency assumptions and forward security lie. Well, we again have uh, the synchronization, which seems to be inherent to this paradigm. And these are the assumptions. We have CDH slash DDH and LWE. And uh, uh, we uh, inherit a security parameter loss uh, uh, in efficiency though. But it still seems to be better than uh, FSPK constructions from similar assumptions though. And one key thing to note is that we have identified a similar blueprint, even though we, haven't, uh, we don't have a generic construction yet. Uh, and that seems to be inherent limitations in trying to come up with the generic constructions because of the way each construction treats what's uh, the how uh, the update happens and the assumptions uh, uh, for the homomorphism that we need. Okay, so let us take a look at the DDH construction very quickly. So this is a quick uh, refresher on the DDH assumption, uh, and we will uh, go quickly into the BHH crypto system. Uh, the idea here is that this is just a variant of the original crypto system. The idea here is that the secret key is L bit string. Along with it, there is also a G1 through GL, which is a public key uh, uh, components. And this, uh, there is another public key component uh, uh, computed as a product of GI to the SI, where SI is just a bit to begin with. And uh, the public key uh, secret key are returned. Enc uh, will just choose a randomness R and will compute each component as GI to the R. And then finally compute C is equal to H to the R times M. Uh, and then return these L plus, uh, this L plus one uh, uh, group element. And then for the secret key, uh, it will simply decrypt it as C times the inverse of each FI to the SI. And it will return M. And these are G is basically a fixed generator of a cyclic group G uh, with prime order P. To be precise, it's G1 through GL. So, what is our DDH construction actually? Our DDH construction is as follows. As before, we will just sample L offsets as indicated before. So Delta is basically a bit string. And then I will compute the new public key offset as GI to the Delta I and new public key as H times H prime, uh, which is computed here. And we will also, uh, encrypt each delta bit by bit, but in the uh, in the um, exponent, which is important for the key, key dependent message security. And we will return PK prime and update ciphertext. Now the update secret key will be in a position to decrypt each delta i, uh, and that's one of the beauty. That's why we need uh, delta to be a bit string to make this. Uh, decryption, this discrete log possible. And then we'll update the uh, secret key S prime as S plus S delta, where it's an addition element by element over ZP and will return S prime, okay? So what has happened is that even though we started off with uh, uh, a bit string, the, this, uh, the resulting secret key that evolves basically grows slowly over ZP. And this is just a quick example on how it grows. Um, so this is our DDH construction. Uh, let us quickly uh, move on to discussing uh, the outline of the security proof. Uh, due to lack of time, I will only look at, uh, introduce the CS plus LR security game, and then discuss how we reduce the UPK security to CS plus LR security, and introduce the various assumptions that we have along the way, such as homomorphisms that we need. Um, so this is the CS plus LR security. As before, we have an adversary, uh, we have a challenger, we have an adversary. The challenger generates PK and SK, and the adversary uh, receives PK from the challenger. And in response, the adversary provides L, M0, and M1. Here, L is uh, a leakage function, which can possibly even be randomized. Uh, and then the adversary, uh, the challenger will choose uh, random bit B, will encrypt it as before, and will also encrypt the secret key under the public key. Though in our case, we will have it bit by bit encryption, but that's just a side subtlety here. And then it will respond with C0, C1, and L of SK, and the adversary now has to guess. Right. 
and the similar uh, advantage as defined before. So in essence, what does the adversary get? The adversary gets an encryption of the challenge message and uh, an encryption of um, S, uh, and, and an encryption of the secret key itself. Um, so, and this is, as I mentioned, L can even be probabilistic. So we only need that there is, uh, there is at most lambda bit loss in um, uh, entropy uh, when, uh, when you condition the secret key on the leakage function. So now we will reduce the UPK security to the CS plus LR security key. So this is how it proceeds. So we will have CS plus LR implies UPKE. So we'll have the challenger. We'll have the uh, the purplish uh, adversary, which plays playing the UPKE game and the red adversary playing the CS plus LR game. Uh, uh, the challenger will produce the public key secret key pair and send PK naught to the red adversary, which forwards it to the purple adversary. Now in return, the purple adversary will provide Delta one I'm not starting a monster. I should mention here that here I'm assuming that Q is equal to one to, to just uh, capture the essence of the game. Uh, even um, you can refer the uh, paper for the full version of the proof. So now what the adversary uh, playing the CS plus LR game does, the red adversary, is that it has to choose a leakage function. And the leakage function is a deterministic, it's a probabilistic leakage function where it, you choose, uh, it asks the, um, the challenger to choose a delta of its choice, delta star to be precise, and then do x plus delta star, where x is the, uh, the secret key. And here, uh, recall that it's l bits long. So here, what I'm doing is that I'm implicitly sending, uh, setting delta star as a randomness for the secure update. So the r star that we saw in the um, UPKE security game is what I'm calling delta star here. And now uh, the red adversary will send l m not star and m one star. And in response, this is what the red adversary receives. It receives a secret key, L of SK, uh, the, the leakage on secret key is, uh, L of SK, which is some uh, L, uh, L uh, length well, L vector, uh, where, sorry, a vector of length L, which is defined as S naught plus delta star, where L, S naught was the original secret key, which is L bits. Delta star is another L, L bits, and then it does this bit by bit addition. It also receives the uh, C naught, uh, which is an encryption of one of the challenge messages M, uh, M not star at M one star, and also receives the secret key uh, or an encryption of the secret key to be precise. And we will call this as N prime because what N prime is that it's basically a bit by bit encryption of S not in the exponent, okay? And uh, so this is what the red adversary has. And we will now look at what the purple adversary needs and how the red adversary is in a position to generate it for the purple adversary. So it needs S, S star is equal to S naught plus delta one plus delta star, which is the new secret key, which is corresponding to the uh, fresh randomness delta star. So fortunately, the, uh, the red adversary already has Z, which is S naught plus delta star. So, and the red adversary knows delta one because it receives delta one from the purple adversary. So it simply does an addition. So we have a check there. So now the, uh, now the red adversary has an encryption of the message, challenge message MB, subject to a public key PK naught, okay? And this PK naught corresponds to a secret key S naught. However, what the uh, adversary uh, purple adversary needs is an encryption of MB corresponding to the key S1 and PK1. So what we have is a key mismatch. So we need key homomorphism, okay? So this is uh, what key homomorphism is. It's basically given a ciphertext and a public key pair corresponding to a secret key S, uh, it will choose a delta and it's in a position to generate a public key secret key pair corresponding to the secret key uh, public key ciphertext pair corresponding to the secret key S plus delta. Okay. So let us look at the construction of um, key homomorphism. Key homomorphism is this primitive, uh, is this function definition. And this is what we have. We parse EK as the L plus one vector and then parse CT also as the L plus one group element. And it will compute H prime as H times G I to the delta I, similar to what you saw in the update public key algorithm. And compute 
C prime uh, also uh, by updating this offset alone, and therefore we'll set uh, PK prime and uh, CD prime as follows, and then communicates uh, PK prime and CD prime as the return value. So what the, uh, the red adversary will do is it will simply compute key homomorphism on PK naught and C naught, and it knows S delta one and it provides that as the offset. Therefore you will get C naught prime, which is also correct. So now let us look at the final, one of the final components, which is C1, which is bit by bit encryption as denoted here. Uh, here, however, what the adversary uh, playing the UPK game needs is uh, each bit by bit of Delta star. So D1 through DL is the offset that is used. Um, corresponding to the L, L bits in delta star. So here we not only have a public key mismatch, uh, the key, uh, we also have a message mismatch. So you need message homomorphism in addition to key homomorphism. So message homomorphism is this, given a ciphertext that encrypts G to the X, you, and given X prime, you want to be in a position to generate a, 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 a ciphertext that will now encrypt G to the X prime minus X. And this is the construction. Um, and uh, we will not go into the details. You can verify the details uh, due to paucity of time. However, uh, we have this construction of message homomorphism. So now what the adversary will do is use first the key homomorphism to update it to the correct key, and then use message homomorphism to generate each and every component that is needed by the purple adversary. And the final component that the purple adversary needs is PK star which is easy to generate from just S star. And therefore it simulates that also perfectly. And now the purple adversary will respond to B prime and the red adversary just forwards that guess. This is the simple reduction that we have. Uh, and um, so, so far what we have seen is that we have seen uh, how to reduce UPKE security to CS plus LR security. So the missing part of the puzzle is to prove that our scheme is actually CS plus LR secure, uh, which we will uh, invite you to look at the full version of the paper. It's available online where we go into the details of the proof uh, and summarize the, the hybrid arguments uh, to prove it to be secure. So with that said, we will um, move on to the conclusion. Um, we do not have time to go over the LWE construction, however, um, we will uh, invite you to again refer to the full version of the paper. So what have we done in this, uh, in this paper? We presented an updatable public key encryption uh, definition and security model. In our paper, we presented two UPK constructions in standard model, one from the DDS assumption and one from the LWE assumption, which is believed to be post-quantum secure. Uh, we also show that two constructions were simultaneously circular secure and naked resilient. Uh, and we presented a possible abstraction and going from PKE to UPKE, where we said a PKE will need CS plus LR security, some kind of key homomorphism and some kind of message homomorphism. And, um, uh, and that's the question, if we can come up with a more genetic uh, construction that goes from any PKE that has these properties to UPKE. And that's all I have time for you. Um, and I would rather I, that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for taking the time to again uh, see the full version of the video. Uh, I, I will take questions during the talk. Thank you.